You're listening to Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. Hi, it's Lisa Birnbach. And you know, sometimes you just need to change the venue. I did. I needed a little break from home, and I had to go somewhere. Where could I run away to just get a basic refresh? I took a break. I went to Los Angeles to visit Exhibit B, and I Velcroed myself to her for four days, and I feel actually refreshed and happy. We, uh, you know, took walks. We ate a lot. We drove a lot. I did have to go to her friend Sarah's birthday party at a tiki bar on Hollywood Boulevard in the depths of Hollywood one night very late. And I know in some ways I was the most exotic creature there because I was old enough to be everybody's parent. But it was just great. My agenda was to spend time with my kid, and my kid and I spent time together. What can I say? And the weather, of course, was very nice. So I am refreshed, and I hope you can hear it in my voice. I am happy to tell you that someone I've known a very long time, Andrew Friedman, is my guest today. He is one of the country's preeminent food writers. He's not a food critic. He writes cookbooks with a lot of important chefs that you know, star chefs, I guess you would call them. And he has a podcast called Andrew Talks to Chefs and a blog called Tokeland, Toke as in the the white hat that chefs used to wear, and a cool book called Chefs, Drugs, and Rock and Roll. And we'll be talking to him. So for that reason, I thought I would talk about my five favorite foods. My five favorite foods are butter, 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 and butter. But in real life, that's just not tenable. So I'm approaching this food thing as five dishes that I've had repeatedly. Not just one spaghetti bolognese somewhere, because how can I recommend it and how can I remember it? Although, now that I think of it, yeah, note to self, spaghetti bolognese is kind of one of the great things. Okay, so here they are. Number one, the Biga breakfast sandwich at Biga Bakery in West Tisbury, Massachusetts, also known as Martha's Vineyard. Now, sadly, Biga is long closed. And interestingly, when I gave myself the assignment to come up with my five favorite dishes, this is the first one that came to mind. I haven't had the sandwich in 10 years, probably, but it still remains a fond memory. Of course, it's eggs, which I used to love, and spinach, and I think think a kind of cheddar, white cheddar on a sourdough, if I'm correct, roll. Oh, and tomatoes. Oh my God. Incredible. I used to walk there from the house we rented with my exhibits and we would each get one and then walk home. And that was like the whole morning. That was our morning. Oh, I love that sandwich. I know they're great egg sandwiches all over the place. I see other people eating them, but that one was momentous. I think the bread was great because it was a bakery. It wasn't a coffee shop. Not that I have anything against coffee shops. Number two, the fried chicken at Root and Bone on the Lower East Side of New York. As some of you know already, fried chicken is my kryptonite. I am weak when it's presented to me or near me. I can do nothing but order it. I become rather like an automaton. The chicken there is superb. The biscuit, superb. The atmosphere, superb. The alcohol, very superb. It's now a place you can get a reservation at through Open Table, but Root and Bone has fantastic fried chicken. Now, a caveat, there are still many fried chicken places in New York and most particularly in Brooklyn, that I have not been to. Feel free to correct me. Feel free to send suggestions of where the best fried chicken is in New York. I I don't even mind Popeyes to tell you the truth. I really don't. But anyway, that is number two. Number three, I'm going to say a classic hamburger at J.G. Mellon's. I've loved J.G. Mellon's for, I would say, almost 40 years. 
even though I'm only 45. I had one almost every night the summer of 1980 when I wrote the Preppy Handbook because it, I lived near a J.G. Mellon's, the main one, and it was just sort of a place I could go feel safe, knew what I liked, didn't have to spend a lot of money, very satisfied. Anyway, Mellon's Burger. Number four. In light of the fact that everything I've just recommended is unhealthy, is cheesy, salty, meaty, delicious, number four is the kale salad at Il Buco in New York. Il Buco is a beautiful restaurant. I don't know why I love it so much. It's it looks kind of like my fantasy of an Italian antique store. The tables have different kinds of chairs, different kinds of plates. Everything's mismatched, but looks like it was meant to be matched. And they have really great food. The kale salad is kind of well known for them. And I'm going to order it tomorrow when we go there. But I haven't been there in a long time. But I've had it more than once. You see, this is the thing. Everything on this list I've had multiple times. So I can swear by it. Number five. The nachos at Tallulah's in Santa Monica, for all my listeners, or dare I say listener, <laughs> in Santa Monica, Tallulah's, what a cool place. The people who work there were so sweet. Even when they didn't seat us, I noticed that they were very kind to the children there. It's kind of a party atmosphere, very informal. It made me realize what New York is missing, which is, you know, indoor, outdoor eating most of the year. The nachos were fantastic. I don't know what was in them, but I think it's farm to table, actually. Oh, everything out there is farm to table. Anyway, delicious, and I love Mexican food. So those are my five great food favorites for this week with a little asterisk about spaghetti bolognese. I used to love it at Parma on 80th and 3rd, and I haven't had that one in so long I can't recommend it. And Vico had great bolognese, but they're out of business. So I'm going to have to find it. Anyway, welcome Andrew Friedman, who talks to chefs and today is talking to us. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Lisa. Nice to see you again. Always good to see you. Always a, a memory lane moment. It, there is, but but because we're sharing this with other people, we yes. won't go too inside. Okay. Um, I want to talk to you about the world of celebrity chefs and specifically whether the concept of a celebrity chef is good for food. Oof. That's uh that's what I used to ask questions to a friend of mine in, who was in law school when I was an undergrad and he would say that's a loaded question. Yeah. It's a loaded <laughs> question. I mean, well, it's, yes. it's the short answer I think is yes. Mm -hmm. Um mostly yes. I think a lot of uh a lot of food trends that have found their way into the mainstream started in restaurants run by what we call celebrity chefs. I don't love the term celebrity chef because um, I think I think if you're a chef who is strictly on television and you don't have restaurants and especially don't ever cook in restaurants, that's to me a celebrity chef. You know, I think somebody, you know, you can take even someone like Bobby Flay, who's known as a celebrity chef. Bobby, you can see he's at his restaurant Gato in Lower Manhattan with some regularity mm -hmm. and checks in on his other places and keeps an eye on his burger and shake business. And I mean, he's involved in his restaurant business. Right. So is Tom Colicchio. Right. So I think I, I don't like calling them that. But these people who are broadly thought of that way, you know, sriracha is something a lot of us now have in our refrigerators at home. Right. White Castle has a sriracha burger. No um, way. I or didn't they even, did. I, I don't know even, if it caught on. but I didn't know why Castle was still extant. Well, maybe they're not. But they had one a year or two ago. I saw a commercial for it. Uh -huh. But that's David Chang. There's, right. There is one reason that we all know what Sriracha is, and it's David Chang. Right? Yeah. yeah. And, um, the, that's the, and you can go back and find articles from the 1980s using words we don't use anymore like oriental cuisine and right. how or, you know because of certain chefs that stuff was finding that you know you could find certain like ginger in the supermarket and cilantro and a lot of that stuff is driven by chefs when you you make such a great point about the people who become 
sort of generic celebrities who are suddenly thrust into a food show and then are I get that they're celebrity chefs but they're they don't really have a portfolio that that legitimizes them in the same way that singers I guess who get on a reality show and win weren't trained to Juilliard or Berkeley School of Music yeah. and suddenly they skip all these steps because of TV but there's a huge difference, though, and I actually love this conversation because here's the difference. Let's say you watch American Idol, mm -hmm. okay? You s hear the person sing, right? And the whether they win or lose, in theory anyway, it's based on how well they sing, how well they perform on a given night, and can they do that over and over and over, right? You watch a sporting event. Somebody becomes a, a, a celebrity in the world of sports, usually, because they have the goods, right? right? They win tournaments or they're on winning teams or they're the MVPs, right? Right. Okay. Now we have young people who go on a cooking show. They may not even win the show. This is the distinct thing about food television. The viewers haven't tasted the food. Right. All you've seen is A, the visual and what the person looks and sounds like. So you have these people... To go back to your first question, I think the question is, is celebrity good for chefs? You know? Okay, good. Because you can, you can get really well known and maybe get the financing for a restaurant or a fast casual concept before you're proven in the marketplace, before the public has rendered a verdict on your, on your food. You know? And that's a complete reversal of the way, you know, if you go back to like the 80s, even the 90s, the way chefs got famous was by being great chefs. You know, you got like a great review in the New York Times and then you got interviewed and people wrote pieces about it. But it was because you were acclaimed as a chef. Right. And then you naturally flowed into being a celebrity. That template is completely reversed. It's so crazy. Yeah. Now, of course, the viewer of Food TV is watching someone taste the food yes. and someone who they respect allegedly is saying, oh, the texture is perfect and the taste is good. There's a little too much sriracha, but, you know, we'll right. let this one go. But so on, on, you know, on prayer and hope, they would go to a restaurant that that person. They might, but I think it's also true that, um, you know, as much as you're hearing people render a verdict on their food, you're spending most of your time watching the person just be them, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, you know, if they have, you know, wear a funny hat or have a shtick or, you know, yell at you, people, whatever it is, yeah. you, they might catch on as a personality, you know, and, and that happens. And a lot of, I, it was interesting. I just was at a conference in San Diego and Brian Malarkey, who has been on Top Chef and, and judges on guys grocery games and does some other stuff, but I, I can't, I can't rattle off a list. But I kind of said something similar to what I just said. And he said, you know, to your point, a lot of people who competed on Top Chef have opened restaurants and a lot of those restaurants have closed, ah. you know, which is not something I cheer for. But as, a, as an observer, I think that's part of the reason. Andrew, how many shows are there in the in the world of food TV? You just mentioned two that I'd never heard of. I mean, are there I, hundreds right now? On oh, no, I don't think there's hundreds. But the truth is... I don't, I don't know. I don't watch many of them. Uh -huh. I mean, there's enough to fill a whole roster on the Food Network and and a couple of sp spots on, uh, PBS, you know, like maybe? PBS and yeah. Discovery and places like that. And then it's like, how broadly are we defining this? Are we including like the Cake Boss and um, and are we including all? Are we including shows that are explicitly about chefs, like Chef's Table mm -hmm. and? Uh, the final table, the Netflix competition show, the global competition show they just had. I and don't know. I the, haven't heard of. I don't know the number. Yeah. I don't know the number. It aired over the holidays. But Actually, it's enormous. I mean, obviously, yeah. there's well, an they enormous. Were very, it was very smart. They they um, they brought in the production values of Chef's Table in the in the uh, format of a competition, and each episode, the chefs would compete uh, in the in the style of a different country and they would have like a top chef and a food writer and someone else associated with that co country so you have all these foodie 
audiences around the world, you know, the week that they're in Mexico, they have like Enrique Olvera of, of Pujol and and uh, a food writer from Mexico City. Oh, and a, and a boxer. They had a boxer, a Mexican, famous Mexican boxer. That's important. And But that was, that's very calculated and very smart. And the chefs were real proven chefs who were competing. Does it do anything good for a proven chef to go on TV and possibly lose a, yes. a title like that? It's 100%. still good for them? Business. Even if they're... Yes. even Okay. Well, you know, Rick good Moonen, to know. Rick yeah. Moonen, who yeah. for years was in New York at Oceana, and right. then he had a place called RM, uh, a seafood restaurant in the, in the desert in Las Vegas. Sadly, that just closed. He's doing some work with a restaurant group in Texas now. Um, but it was on the record, so I assume I can say it. I saw him a few years ago. He had done Top Chef Masters, and he told me that his business in Vegas went up 300%. Wow. And it's not even just television. If you talk to chefs who are making this, like on the circuit now, which I've been on a little bit the last year because I was promoting a book, and you know somebody like Nancy Silverton, who's a legend. A legend in Los Angeles. Who, into her 60s, is still traveling a ton, going to a lot of conferences and, and festivals and whatnot. And she will tell you, she th looks at that as part of her job. You know, I compare it to when you hear Congress people say they spend like, what is it, 25% of their time or half their time? In their home office? Outside their, because uh, it's illegal to do it from their Senate office, right? Right. Making uh, fundraising calls. Right. Uh, that's what I think of as with chefs. Like it, it, it's paying your dues. It looks in a like way. a boondoggle. It looks like you've abandoned your restaurant. It looks like you're just living the life and, and have kind of uh, decided to ignore your responsibilities. But in fact, it's so competitive now. And there's so many people, you know, rest, the restaurant business is not a, it's, it's not a supply and demand situation right now. The reason there's so many restaurants, which means the reason there's so many restaurant closings, is that there's so many people who have a dream of being in the restaurant business, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, you can compare it to actors. There's a lot of actors out of work, but they, you know, it doesn't cost you know, $5 million to produce each of them, right? right. There's no overhead. But they have a dream, yeah. Yeah. right? It's the same math. The, the difference is now, and this is why you know, you're starting to see a lot of people leave what have traditionally been the A markets and going to Minneapolis, Portland, Oregon, you know, places that now have these thriving restaurant scenes. Providence, Rhode Island. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. These places have, it's because, I mean, one of the reasons is it's just become a nightmare to do business in and compete in New York, San Francisco, LA, you know, what if Chicago, it's tough. It's yeah. really tough, and there's not enough diners. I mean, uh, New York right now, I've heard from a lot of people in the last few weeks, there's a huge new, whatever you want to call it, I call it the largest duty-free shop in, in the world, but this new complex, Hudson Yards. Hudson Yards, with right. With a ton of restaurants in there by huge chefs with huge names like Thomas Keller and Jose Andres. Right. There's people in New York who have very popular restaurants who, if you know them personally, they'll tell you in a quiet moment that their business right now is a little soft. Yeah, yeah. Because all the blood's flowing to Hudson Yards. Everyone's over there checking out these places. Well, interesting. Uh, Hudson Yards, uh, we're taping this on uh, April 17th. Um, and I have to say that Hudson Yards is open only two weeks, right? Something like that. Two, two, two and a two half, and a half yeah. weeks. And you're saying that it's it's really it's really draining the other yeah. restaurants. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying they're empty, but yeah. They're it's interesting it. because I read that Milos, which is one of my favorite restaurants in New York, a Greek fish restaurant, mm -hmm. has which is uh, always I always think of it in in two ways: great food, very expensive, and apparently the the Milos in the Hudson Yards is even more expensive. Oh yeah, I mean the place. Um... You know, there's this line in The Great Gatsby where they say. Uh... Is it Daisy's voice is full of money? Yes. Yeah, and and Hudson Yards is a place that reeks of money. Yeah. If you go there, it's people dressed in these very expensively casual outfits, and 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 I mean the store. Have you been over? No, not yet. I mean the stores are. I mean just super high end. Um, you know the food I've had over there. I, I have to be honest. There's some. I have some very good friends who were in business there. My friend Michael Lamonico has Hudson Yards Grill, uh -huh. and I, I hope he does great there. Um, uh, someone who knows uh, the chef of Mar, which is one of the restaurants in Jose Andres's uh, Little Spain Market there, 
um, took me to dinner there recently, and I have to say it was a phenomenal Spanish seafood dinner. Well, it was phenomenal. It was mobbed. There's even in New York. There's only so many p- people that are dining in expensive restaurants. Well, right, you know? right. And the other piece is the staffing because yeah. you know those they opened. I don't know how many restaurants like in one day. At, you know, where did those employees come from? So everyone's looking for good cooks in front of house people. They're legal, by the way, legal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, I'm saying like, where did they come from in terms of? For the city to absorb that many new restaurants, both from a staffing standpoint and from a customer standpoint, it's it's something's got to give. I mean, we're going to see a lot of closings the next year or two. Uh, I'm sure you're right. Uh, obviously, a lot of people going to Hudson Yards restaurants are also, they're counting on tourists who who will make up a large portion of that population, I would yeah. think. Yeah, 100%. So... Contrast that with the article that Frank Bruni wrote in the Times not too long ago, which has gotten a lot of traction about what do people over 50, I I, I know it's not everybody, but what do people over 50 like in a restaurant? And the preponderance of responses is quiet, not the hottest happening place because it's too chaotic, and they want to be known to the staff. They want to feel like they're going to a place that welcomes them personally. Mm-hmm. So if that's really the truth of what's going on with adults, how is that going to change the restaurant marketplace? I mean, well, in New York or anywhere, I guess. Uh, I. I don't know that it will. I think there's always been places where all that, everything you just said is true. Um, uh, What's well, interesting I, I don't to know. see it was Frank interesting. Bruni say that because he used to be the Daily Restaurant Reviewer at the yes. New York Times. So his job was to go try every new great place or bad place. And yeah. he was he was a terrific reviewer. I enjoyed his writing. I love his writing. Yeah. He's a nice guy. And He's a smart. nice guy. Um, he, his book was great. Um, he, uh, you know, I mean, I think it, I don't, I mean, it's hard for me a little bit cause I'm over 50 and like, I mean, yes, I like to be known that everyone likes to be known. Uh, but the other, the noise doesn't bother me. The chaos of a new place doesn't really bother me. I don't want to go to too much trouble to get in, right. but I don't mind if it's a zoo. Um, but I, I think those places have always, to me, it's more. That was more about where, he, where he's like going to gravitate toward, um, you know. Because it's, I mean, the, the flip side of that is, where do young people not want to be? Where there's older people, right? <laughs> oh my gosh, we were just at Mercer Kitchen. Oh my gosh, I haven't been there in forever. Okay, and and the average age is twenty seven. Really? Yes, of the diners, not the waiters. Yeah, and. You know, again, this is a high ticket restaurant and it's kind of amazing to to look and it's a big restaurant. As you look around, everyone is young. Everyone is is fabulous. Yeah. And you know, I I guess Did it... I I didn't feel as comfortable there. Really? I, well, I, well, I mean, I didn't really care. I had my food and it was yeah. good and it was fine and and it was convenient to where we had been earlier in the night but wow you know it did it did, yes i felt i felt old there hmm that's not I a don't good know. feeling yeah i don't i haven't i don't know i haven't given into that feeling i just yeah. i just refuse to but um that's interesting about that restaurant because that restaurant's been around for oof, at least 20 years and for people who don't know that is a john george von grichten restaurant um, I mean, his flagship restaurant in New York is a three Michelin star restaurant, but it's been around long enough. There is it a sure there, has. I'm but sure that hotel still has a kind of well, sex appeal. That location, yeah. It's down, you know, it's downtown, and right. it's, it's in Soho, and and uh, but I think it, and I think it's still on the menu. They have a they have a a tribute to a chef from the '80s, <laughs> Barry Wines, tuna and wasabi pizza. Yes, it's still on the menu. With Barry Wine's name. Yes, now, yes. I would venture to say 
Not a single one of the diners you're talking about has any clue who Barry is. He I was would... a legendary, he was the first American chef to have four stars in New York City. At the Quilted Giraffe? At the Quilted Giraffe, and he had pizza, uh, tuna wasabi pizza. And when John George opened that restaurant, his tribute to Barry, that was on the menu. It's always been on the menu. It's still on the menu. Yeah, but so it's hard for me to fathom that that can still be there and they can be serving 27-year-olds. It'd be interesting to know if any of the 27-year-olds order that pizza, but I guess they do, otherwise it would and stay oh, I'm sure on the they menu. Do. I just yeah. probably have no idea who Barry is. Well, they probably think Barry wine is a kind of wine uh, that it was marinated in. Maybe. Yeah. yeah it's marinated in Barry wine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Barry wine is not a marinade. Spaghetti bolognese, which I mentioned before, I'm going to say that I love the version at John and Vinny's in Los Angeles. Uh, that was a huge weight off my shoulder. Have you been there yet? I have not. Okay. Well, next time you're in L.A., try it. I will. I am a fan of their other restaurants. But so now let's just sort of segue. I feel I feel full with all the wonderful food we've talked about. Let's go to your five things for this week. Okay. Well, my this is kind of an evergreen list. Is that all right? That's that's very good. And they don't have to be in order or they can be. Okay. However you designate. Well, one is. It's timely and evergreen. Elvis Costello. Yes. Okay. Who is performing. He's going on tour with with Blondie. Blondie. Yes. I know. We're trying to get tickets. And uh, we just bought tickets. They're they're doing some East Coast dates and some West Coast dates. I don't think anything in between. Um, But we're seeing them. I've never been there, but we are going to the Bethel... Arts Center, which is the... Oh, in Connecticut. In upstate New New York. York. It is the Woodstock... Woodstock... It is the site of the Woodstock Festival. Wow. Yes. This is my new move. It's it's seeing who's coming through and then seeing if they're close enough. So they're also playing Forest Hills. Right. Yeah. That's where, where I think we're going to go see so them. So we're going to the Bethel Arts, uh, whatever they call it, the Bethel Arts, I don't know. I don't center, Mm -hmm. and uh, it's in upstate New York. They have lawn seats, which I need for an Elvis Costello concert because I shall dance. Right. Yes. Yeah. Well, and probably for Don Blondie too. But you love Elvis Costello. Yes. We're not going to talk about how long we've known each other, but a million years ago in the office where I worked, yes, which you had seen, I had a giant black and white Elvis Costello poster of the album Trust. Right. With just him looking over his sunglasses. Right. And uh, we go way back. We go. He's the big constant in my life. Um, you may have named a child after my him. My son's name is Declan, which is Elvis's real name. That's true. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Elvis Costello is number one. But so that's both an evergreen for me and something some listeners could maybe do in the next couple of months. That's right. Something to look forward to and a musical opportunity for us on this show. Wink, wink. Okay. Okay. Number two. Number two is my meditation. I meditate every morning. Do you? Yes, but it is my own meditation. I was overwhelmed with the different types of meditation that there are out there. Mm -hmm. All the different podcasts, all the different things you can download, all Mm -hmm. the different, right? And I have, over the last year, honed my own meditation. And it's basic. It's not spiritual. A little bit it is. But really, it's a list of things that I want to keep front and center in my mind over the course of a day. Mm -hmm. And I spent about a half hour looking at one, closing my eyes, deep breathing, and it really helps. It really helps. Do you change the five I I revise it. Yeah. Yeah. From day to day. Yes. And the list can be very long, but it's everything from uh, say no. That's an important thing for me. Yeah. I need to know I can say no to people. And I will tell you, on days where I don't meditate, I oftentimes have found that I've said yes to something that you requires really a lot of time. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, if only I had meditated today. Uh, <laughs> I think for everyone who has a real job who's listening, those of us in the freelance world sort of have talked ourselves into saying yes to everything. Yeah. Right. Because you don't know when the next assignment yes. or opportunity will come. So Yes. Um, so 
Yeah, but then I have things that you know that are much that are you know verge on the spiritual. Mm -hmm. Like if 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 I write with joy instead of stress, I have all the time in the world. Yes, wonderful. That's an important thing to think about. Yes, you know that's terrific. Um, so that's one thing. Do you, uh, eyes closed, sitting in a certain position, sitting in a certain room, anything like yeah, that. Yeah, there. We recently did some rearranging in our house. We had an armchair that was in our living room. It's now, we're out of the city now. We live just north of New York City in the suburbs, so we have things I didn't have in the city, like an office, like a, <laughs> a spacious uh -huh. home office. And uh, the armchair has come upstairs, and it is in the corner of the office, uh -huh. and there's a little sort of ottoman foot thing, and there's a little side table next to it, and a little reading lamp. And I go in there in the morning, when the house is still dark, Although now at this time of year it's light there's a little more light outside and I turn on the little reading lamp and I go through each one and close my eyes and spend as much time on it as I need. I mean I spend about a half hour doing this. Wow. You know, I tell myself I'm going to feel some of it is punitive. I'll, I'll t I tell myself how bad I'll feel if I don't exercise that day at the end of the day. Mhm. Mm you know, things mm -hmm. like that. Um uh It's a tough love meditation. Yeah, it's my <laughs> meditation. Um, Andrew. But it's achieves it achieves a lot of goals for me. How long have you been doing it? I started doing it in maybe the end of last summer. And I revise it constantly. Everybody tells me meditation is the way. Yeah. I think a lot of people would not consider this meditation. <laughs> well, too but bad. This is my meditation. Yeah, this damn is it. what I call it. My meditation. <laughs> okay. But I think everyone could do some version of this and cuz I'm not spiritual. I'm not like I when I was in college I went to a hypnosis show and they do a little thing at the beginning where every they had you close your eyes. It was at Caroline's at the Seaport. Oh, which I is remember normally that a comedy club. club yeah. Or was. Was. And yeah. they had you close your eyes and imagine that there was a helium balloon tied to your hand. And then they'd say open your eyes. And if your hand was in the air, you were susceptible to right. hypnosis. I'm not susceptible to hypnosis. When I did college theater or high school theater and I directed, I always had an assistant director who could do the warm-up exercises. Uh, I just can't do that. I think it's it's not me. Uh -huh. You know, I feel silly. You can't be a tree. I'm not. I Whatever that means, yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So this is my meditation. This okay. is what I'm, but it works. It really helps. It, days I don't do it, I will make a big mistake in some way. You will feel it. I'll lose my temper with somebody. I'll say, yes, I'll help you with that event that means nothing to me, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like or whatever. I um, just hoped you meditated the day you said you'd do this show with that's me. That's funny. Come on. Okay. Of course. Well, I had I would, to ask. I was flattered. Okay. And honored. Okay. Okay. Number three. Walking. Yay, walking. Who doesn't hate... I mean, who doesn't <laughs> love walking? Who hates walking? Not I. Yes, not you. But not just anywhere. Here, right? New Correct. York? Look, look what I wrote. Look at number three. Oh, yeah. Walking the streets of New York. Walking the streets of New York. This time of year, I love it. Um, it's energizing when the spring <sighs> finally shows up. I, um, I, if I had a number six on this list, it would be my Bluetooth headphones. Uh -huh. Um Listening to a podcast, listening to music. Uh, I have neighborhoods where I have specific things I list, like... I still listen to Velvet Underground or Lou Reed when I'm like, you know, below Houston Street. Oh, fun. I do. Um, You're a traditionalist. I'm a traditionalist. <laughs> so, but I love it. And the other thing is, for me, I took off a ton of weight a couple of years ago, and mostly it was walking. Because, because you have to eat for a living. Yeah, to some extent. I mean, yeah. I'm not like a critic, but, but I hate the gym. I love playing tennis, tennis. but- um, you know, I love walking in New York and in the, in the spring, summer, early fall, even eat, this will sound crazy, but I could start my day in Midtown and I might have a dinner in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And if I have time, I will walk to Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Wow. I will. That's I fantastic. It. And you know, you 10, 12 miles a day. Uh, that takes care of a lot. It does. Burns it a does. lot of calories. And it's also endorphin producing. Yes. I no just doubt about it. I yeah. just love it. It's thinking time. Yep. It's really good. It's, it's good. It's really good. Good for you. Okay. Now this is this is a vague thing, but I think I think for a lot of people the marker where this starts to happen is when you have kids. Okay, it's number four. This is number four. And it is different for everybody. It is that thing that you're letting slip away or have let slipped away. Oh. So for me. 
I have not let these things slip away, mm -hmm. right? But I'm constantly in danger of it. Tennis, I play tennis all the time, and movies. I love right. going. I love going to the movies, and I have so many friends. And and if I haven't seen them in a while, those I'll say, Are "You still playing tennis?" And they'll go, "Nah." <laughs> you know? Yeah. Or have you seen a movie? Oh, we haven't seen a movie in a year. Right. And I'm sorry. It is, to me, that's... You're that's starting, giving in. It's giving in. It's, 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 as we say in tennis, you need to play the ball. Don't let the ball play you. I think it's... We say that in every, in every respect, but right? But I think it's letting, yeah. it's letting age take over. It's letting... You can find Andrew, the time. Andrew, that is so good. That's such a wise one. And it's one that I fall prey to. Um, uh, and my kids are grown, but or my exhibits are grown. But, you know, the fact is you do start to feel, oh, if I do something for myself, like play tennis or go to a movie, it's selfish and I'm not contributing to my family's life. But if you're making yourself happy, of course, you're making your family happy. Yeah, I mean, everyone who knows, my late mother-in-law used to notice this. Like if I, if she was around and I just played tennis, right? Um, she would say to me, and she was very like spiritual and she meditated and did Tai Chi and, um, and uh, was a practicing Buddhist. And, you know, I would come back and she would say, your entire energy is different from right. when you left the house, right? And yeah. there was a huge um, like carryover effect from that. You know, I'd be good for like the day. Right. You know, I was just great. So whatever it is for anybody, it could be reading, it could be walking, it could be gardening, it could be whatever it is, cooking. It could be going for a walk yeah, for an hour. Yeah, it could be anything. Yeah. But I just, just think, I it. know so many people who have just like thrown their arms up and let it go. Have and you I given think them pep talks, by the way? When they say, no, oh, man, I can't, I don't have the time, my back uh, hurts. If I'm honest, only only in the most opportunistic ways, like if I'm looking for, for someone to play partner. tennis. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, then I'll say, don't you think you good. owe it to yourself? Yeah, don't yeah. you think you owe it Saturday to yourself at 9 o'clock? Nine o'clock when I have a court? Yeah. 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 I. By the way, on this podcast last summer, I talked about how fun it was to watch tennis with you. Oh, oh yeah, Open. we had that run in. Yes, we yes. bumped into one another yes. and we saw some great tennis we did. by people I'd never heard of. Yes. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was yeah, fun. Was You're good to watch tennis with, Thank I you. must say. Thank you very much. Okay, my last thing is openness. Hmm. Now, this also comes from being ju just a, you know, a little bit north of 50. Uh, I interview a lot of people for my work. And I interview people of different generations mm -hmm. who do the same work. I interview a lot of chefs. Right. And uh, I find that there are people who are open to the fact, it's such a simple phrase, but that things change. Things change. And I think you have to be mindful of that and open to that always. Uh, they don't necessarily change for the worse. Uh, in my world, I know chefs who are absolutely dismayed at the fact that you can go to the grill, which is the in the former home of the Four Seasons, in like shirt sleeves, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's like sacrilegious. Right. Uh, there are people who are dismayed that a restaurant like I'm mentioning David Chang again. I don't don't know why, but um, Momofuku Sambar, which was his second restaurant, got three stars from the New York Times. The waiters are in t-shirts and there's no seat backs. Right. You know? Right. And that was like scandalous. Right. Now, the funny thing to me about the people I'm talking about is when they were in their 20s and opening game-changing restaurants in New York, they were the young punks, right? right? They were doing American food, not French. Right. And American wines. American wines. And the waiters weren't in tuxedos and, you know? Yes. And that was... And there were all these old guard people, like, you know, staring daggers at them, right. you know, and they've forgotten their own lesson. Yeah, and, that's interesting. But I think it's, I think it's normal. I think it is something that you need to very consciously resist, unless um, you just naturally don't have an issue with it. You know, it's funny. Before we started recording, you and I were talking. I was just at this conference, and the great chef Jeremiah Tower was there. And Jeremiah, in his mid seventies, is absolutely open to anything. Hmm. I mean, he has no. Uh, I mean, he has nostalgia for his own restaurants and what he did and his team and all that. But he 
is open to whatever is coming next. You know, he's absolutely... You have to be at peace with yourself to do that. I think you do. You need to not be threatened by it. Right, you know? not and, threatened by... Yeah, the... and I think that's what's behind a lot of it usually is people see maybe their own mortality, their own irrelevance, their own whatever as, as, as the collateral of change. Well, speaking as someone slightly older... And not wiser. I think we all see our obsolescence in the in the mirror, you know, and I suppose that a chef who's been doing it for 40 years can also lose lose sight of the fact that he or she was once a pioneer. You I know, think so. You but can... I think but I think it's becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. Yeah. I'm like sure. you said what you just said, but you have a podcast. You know, indeed, like the kids, I do. like the kids, like the kids do. No, yeah. so so, and I went to a tiki bar this week. There you go. Yeah. So, I think, I think the only way to be is is receptive to these things, and and everyone has, you know, again to, to bring it back to my world, you know, I I do think there's, you know, it's like they say every prize fighter has a certain number of fights. Mm-hmm. Every chef has a certain point at which they just can't. Unless they were so ahead of their time, like like Jonathan Waxman, who has Barbudo here in New York, which is sadly closing. It is. Oh yeah. Oh, they that can't, is sad. They the new owners don't want a restaurant down the downstairs. The restaurant's doing great. I'm gonna have to go there for the roast chicken. So soon. But you know, Jonathan was so ahead of his time. So ahead. So unless you're somebody like that, there comes a point where your food just you can't keep up. Nobody can. And it's like rock musicians. At some point, you're doing the nostalgia tour, right? Right. Instead of the new album. Right. Well, you know, what's interesting, too, is there's so much content, which is apropos of everything. So you read that Christina Tozzi is making these desserts with cereal milk. I'm sure there were a lot of chefs, not great ones, who said, all right, we're going to try to do something with cereal milk. I mean, th- you you want to be relevant and you want people to want you. And I, I mean, I do have empathy for the people who say my kind of cooking is too old school or, you know, nobody wants a cream sauce anymore. Or everybody's gluten free. I mean, that is a factor of modern life is that now there are all these food allergies that didn't exist when these yeah. chefs got to really I, I have one. I think I do too. Recently discovered. Just just but, last week. But but the what did you just discover? Well, um I, I found out oh, a I few, heard I heard you talking about no this. No eggs. Yeah. And I think I still have eggs in my food, but I don't eat an egg. I haven't yeah. had an egg since January. Mm. God, I You'll miss be okay. It. I miss it. But but what I was going to say is, you know, people can transition into other roles, you know. Somebody with a ton of experience as a chef can maybe, you know, there are a number of restaurants in New York, I think, where if the chef was smart, they would bring in at this point a young, promotable chef mm-hmm. to whom they would be sort of a, you know, a mentor, a mentor. and an editor. Right. Right. And but have someone there who's young, who's doing new things, who is promotable, mm-hmm. who will be fresh for the press, mm-hmm. and 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 that'll make a restaurant feel m- newly relevant. I, right? I agree. But I, I agree. think that's a rare. That almost never happens. Right. That oh, almost never happens. You never hear about it. The way you hear, let's say, fashion designers take a hot young new designer and groom him or yeah. her to be their protege and yes. then take over a line. Yeah. You don't yeah. hear about that. But I think, I just say it all the time, I think I just think there's no other way to be. I think it's not that hard to learn how to use new technology, you know? I think everyone needs to realize almost anything you need or want to learn how to do is Googleable in about two seconds, and mm-hmm. you can probably even find a video in two seconds that'll show you how to do it. Right. The number of people who don't know how to access, use their podcast app is astonishing to me. Yeah, speaking of which, people, there's a podcast app. It's purple. Yeah. It's on the face of your phone. You can find Andrew's podcast, uh-huh. Andrew Talks to Chefs, there. Thank you. And you can find this podcast, Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. And um, it's true. It's easy to do. People can subscribe to yours. Free. Free. I love that. People can subscribe to mine free. 
Awesome. Yeah. And we're also on Stitcher and Apple Podcasts and YouTube and Google Play and on my website, lisabernbach.com. I want to thank you, Andrew. Thank you for having me. It's just, I could talk to you about a lot of things. And as you have all guessed, we've known each other for a very long time and through changes of your career paths. Yes. Many. Many. And, and I, I love your career. Thank you. It's basically food, talking, writing, and tennis, playing, and writing. And it's, yes. it's you've, you've created a beautiful life doing what you love. Thank you. And uh, as for the rest of you, be mindful. Do what Andrew said. I'm going to. I'm going to start meditating as if I were Andrew. And stay cool and act natural. Bye-bye. That was Five Things with Lisa Bernbach. New episodes every Friday, if she remembers. <laughs> <laughs>